Welcome to a captivating exploration of twisted minds. In this video, we delve into the dark and mysterious lives of two serial killers you may not have known, Gary Charles Edward and Andrew Philip Kinnanen. Prepare to be immersed in a chilling journey that reveals the depths of their troubled psyches and the harrowing tales they left behind. Gary Charles Edward Originally from Troy, young Gary Evans spent his childhood under the blows of both parents. His father rapes him when the boy turns eight and he cannot count on the help of a mentally ill and suicidal mother. At eight years old, he committed his first theft by stealing jewelry and comic books for an amount of more than $1,000. A few years later, he went to live for a while with his sister who had just married. But her husband was violent, she divorced almost immediately. His mother will also separate the same year from Gary's father and leave to join her new husband, Gary and his sister in Cohoes, in the state of New York. At 15, Gary received his first sentence, 90 days in prison for robbing a neighbor. The following year, her mother moved again and remarried two men whom she ended up divorcing, as both turned out to be equally violent. She then decides to turn to feminine love. Meanwhile, Evans befriends Tim Reisdorf and Michael Falco and moves in with them. Until now the young man lived in a shed or in the woods. He meets a woman, Deirdre Fuller with whom he will have an episodic relationship that will span 13 years. One day, he'll get mad at her for the simple fact that her new boyfriend is Afrotype. Gary finds it hard to be replaced by a black man and will demand that the young woman return all the gifts offered to him. Later, he will reveal that he wanted to kill them, but will never take action. At the age of 22, he was arrested for having robbed a house in Lake Placid, New York, and found himself sentenced to four years in prison. He will serve his sentence at Clinton Penitentiary, Danamora, then Great Meadow. That year, he learned of the death of his father who had died of cancer. After two years of incarceration, Gary is released and goes back to live with Tim and Michael where he immediately recovers from their complicity, to rob. Arrested again for a booty of a few dollars, he goes back to prison from which he escapes before being caught five hours later. He was then placed in solitary confinement and returned to Clinton Penitentiary. In 1982, he was transferred to Attica before leaving at the end of the year. As before, he immediately resumes his vices and goes back to burglaries with his early accomplices, Tim and Michael. The following year, his mother died. She was 51 years old. At Easter, he was again arrested and locked up in Saratoga Penitentiary, then in Montgomery. In 1984, he was released under judicial supervision, which did not prevent him from resuming his criminal activities. Michael Falco robs a jewelry store and seizes $15,000. The policeman who sees them outside will control them but will let them go without searching their vehicle. He will steal another $12,000 afterward and will be arrested again. There again, he received a four-year sentence commuted in two and went back to prison in Rensselaer. Released in July 1985, Gary Evans got rid of Michael Falco in the apartment he shared with him and Tim. He shoots her in the head and would, with Tim's help, wrap the body in a tarp before going to bury her in Lake Worth, near Gary's sister's house. In August, he was arrested again and wrote his first letters to Inspector Horton. To his sister, he confides that he wants to resume a relationship with an ex-friend he has not seen for 15 years and confesses that he wants to kill any man who would prevent their story from happening. This woman's name is Johan Donovan. At Horton, Gary complains that he's not being released. He has done more than his sentence and must leave, but each time, his exit is postponed. It will be effective until March 1988, instead of December 1987. While in prison, Gary bonded with a world-famous serial killer, the son of Sam, Berkowitz. He even dares to make fun of him by calling him David Berserkowitz and will get angry with him when Berkowitz dares to offer him a fitness magazine with an African-American on the cover. Out, Gary teams up with Damien Cuomo, Johan Donovan's boyfriend. The two men, in the continuity of the previous crimes, rob an establishment, dressed in ski masks, armed with two stun guns, a walkie-talkie, a crowbar, adhesive tape, screwdriver, handcuffs, a police scanner, etc. 
to foil law enforcement's plans, Evans and Cuomo swung shoes three sizes larger than theirs. On December 26, 1989, Evans killed Damian Cuomo by repeatedly punching him and shooting him with a .22 caliber shot, then buried him. He then leaves for California with the intention of seeing an old girlfriend, Stacy, who rejects him. The young woman is happily married and has no intention of having anything to do with him again. Evans, sheepish, returns to New York. The following year, he killed a jewelry store owner, Gregory Jubin, with three revolver shots in the head and stole more than $60,000. Two years later, he robs another jewelry store, this time without causing any human damage, but leaves all the same with a pretty windfall of $20,000. Incarcerated for the theft of a marble bench in Albany, he was released a month later. To celebrate, he goes to a public library in Vermont, Woodstock, where he gets locked up and steals James Audubon's book, Birds of America. Caught, he receives a 25-month prison sentence. He will be released on June 6, 1996, and once again comes into contact with his childhood friend, Tim Reisdorf. Saratoga Springs, New York, October 4, 1997. Dina Reisdorf is worried. Her husband, Tim didn't come home last night. This absence is unusual, especially since it's not like Tim to go to bed without telling his wife. Dina, in a panic, ends up calling her sister-in-law who asks her when she last spoke to her husband. It was at one o'clock the day before. Tim had let her know that he had just met an old friend who needed her help, but that he would be home soon. 24 hours later, Dina ends up going to the police station and filing a missing person report there. The police think at first sight of a case of a marital dispute, but the wife reminds them that the next day was to take place the wedding of his sister-in-law and that in any case, Tim would never let his son down, whatever the circumstances. Tim Reisdorf, the seventh child in a family of nine, grew up in the small town of Troy, New York. At 35, he married Dina and moved with her and their son to Saratoga Springs. During the day, he works in a sorting center and in the evening, plays drums in a rock band. Always in a good mood, ready to help others, a few days before his disappearance, his wife informed the police of her change of mood. Tim seemed very preoccupied, worried and refused to answer his wife's questions about it. She adds, confiding in the police that a long-lost friend had reappeared in her husband's life. Not remembering his name, the police searched the telephone records for traces of this mysterious childhood friend. Without success. At most they managed to corroborate Tim's call to his wife at one o'clock in the morning as she told them. One detail, however, intrigues the officer in charge of the case. He notices the beauty of the furniture at the Reisdorf's and wonders how Tim, with his small salary, managed to pay for this kind of furniture. What if activities with this old friend weren't so legal? Dina refutes the thing. For her, her husband was an exemplary person who only went out to play football with his son or to play in his band. Moreover, the income of the group could very well explain the purchase of the furniture. He did a lot of shows. But the investigators experienced in their trade have the intuition that something illegal is going on down there. They search the warehouse that Tim rented and discover that he came there the night of his disappearance. Luckily, the surveillance cameras caught it all. The inspectors then view the tapes on which we can see Tim and another man getting out of a pickup. Police officer Jim Horton then recognizes Gary Evans, a notorious criminal whom he arrested for burglary in 1985 and whom he had found a job in landscaping upon his release from prison. To avoid being identified, Gary Evans has the habit of making up, sometimes wearing a beard, sometimes a wig, shaving his hair, to escape the police. Inspector Jim Horton is hardly surprised to find Evans in a new scheme. A few days later, the police seized Tim Reisdorf's car and discovered in the trunk of it a bag of tools including a crowbar and various other tools used to commit a burglary. No more doubt. The two men were linked in ways other than a youthful friendship. Following the trail, the police obtain Evans' federal file and come across the name of his ex-girlfriend, Johan Donovan. Their astonishment is great when he discovers that the father of her child also mysteriously disappeared eight years earlier after taking part in Evans' schemes. 
Their plan, therefore, is simple. Get close to Donovan so she lures Evans to New York State for questioning and arrest. But the task turned out to be more difficult than expected. The young woman was mostly drugged or drunk and it took the inspector weeks and weeks for the young woman to begin to trust him, to let him into her home. The inspector gives him money from time to time, brings him business, and tries to establish a friendly relationship to subsequently lure Gary Evans into his nets. Johan ends up agreeing to collaborate. That's good because Evans seems to be trying to reach her. But the man, suspicious, does not call the young woman directly at home, fearing that her phone is tapped. He goes through an intermediary, a bartender responsible for transmitting the message of a telephone meeting at the bar for the next day. The establishment's telephone is immediately tapped, but on D-Day, the conversation is brief. Johan leaves the bar and goes to three other establishments in the city under the injunctions of Evans, more suspicious than ever, despite being penniless and desperate. He knows he's wanted for several robberies. Desperate, the man asks Johan to lend him his car and give him information on local antique dealers to rob them. He arranged to meet her the next day at a restaurant in the town of St. Johnsbury, near Montpellier, Vermont, a five-hour drive from Saratoga. The authorities of Vermont and more particularly the detectives Lang and Sinclair are then informed by Horton. The three men together devise a plan to set up a surveillance team and apprehend Evans without incident. The stakes for the Saratoga police are enormous. They remove Johan Donovan from the operation to be sure that there will be no problem. Evans had told the young woman that he would be armed. The man, in fact, knows that he will spend his life behind bars, or even more if he gets caught. He would rather be killed than surrender, even if it meant wreaking havoc around him. At the scene of the meeting, a dozen plainclothes police are waiting, ready to take action. The atmosphere is tense. Today is May 28, 1998. Evans waits for Johan in a park across the street from the restaurant from the supposed encounter. Noticing the menage of this man who hides behind a tree, the agents go out at the same time and all go towards him. Gary Evans feels he is surrounded and jumps over a railing. He flees running towards the road, but other policemen arrive, dog on a leash. Evans realizes he has no chance and throws himself to the ground to surrender. Handcuffed, he was taken to the station and searched. On his wrist, under his watch strap, the police find a handcuff key ready to be used to free himself and flee. Rather than interrogate him, Inspector Horton decides to let Evans simmer for a week in his cell and come to him. He knows that the man will not speak if he is pushed around. It works. The inmate contacts Horton and asks to see him. The two men meet in an interrogation room. The discussion is rather friendly at first. The inspector is not trying to point out Evans, quite the contrary. He does not tell her about the death of Tim Reisdorf, nor about the disappearance of Johann's ex-boyfriend, Colmo. It is only after seven hours of discussions that Detective Horton gets to the heart of the matter using the image of Reisdorf's son waiting for his father day after day without hearing from him. What happened to him? When will he be back? Why have you abandoned me? The kind of thing a kid might ask for when his dad suddenly disappears. Horton seeks to bring into play empathy and emotion. And it works. Little by little Evans opens up and speaks. He confesses to having shot Tim Reisdorf in his warehouse for fear of seeing him talking about the burglaries they had committed together. He took advantage of a moment of inattention from Tim to shoot him. Afterwards, he dismembered it using a chainsaw then threw the pieces into bags and mopped the floor with bleach and paper towels. A few days later, he leads the investigators to the place where he threw the remains of Tim, his childhood friend, land outside the city of Troy. During the next five days of interrogation, Evans confessed to five other crimes, two antique dealers robbed in New York State in 1989 and 1991, then Michael Falco and Damien Cuomo in December 1989. For the latter, Evans staged a separation. He indeed made Johan think her boyfriend had let her down by sending her a signed letter from Cuomo and emptying the apartment of his belongings. Johan, upset to be abandoned in this way, 
then threw herself into the arms of Evans, a welcome comforter. In prison, Evans' physical and mental condition deteriorates. The man is gradually losing control. His gaze is extinguished, he no longer washes. However, he continues to write to Agent Horton to whom he shares his thoughts, taking him for his friend and certainly seeking to manipulate him. Held in prison in Albany, New York, Gary Evans is waiting to appear in court. He is on his third conviction and in this state, a third conviction is worth life imprisonment. He knows it and this idea is unbearable to him. As he is brought back in a prison van after attending a preliminary hearing, Evans, determined as ever to escape, manages to get rid of his handcuffs on the way back and breaks the rear window. He escapes, jumps off the highway bridge from a height of 20 meters, and kills himself instantly. On the last letter received a few days later by Inspector Horton, Gary Evans had written this, I won. He knew he would not end his days in prison. Here we come to the end of Gary Charles Edwards' story. We now go inside another twisted mind. Be ready to explore in detail. Andrew Philip Andrew Philip Cannanen was born in 1969 in a working-class neighborhood of San Diego. His mother is the daughter of Sicilian immigrants, and his father, Pete Cannanen, is of Philippine origin and a former soldier converted into a broker and incidentally, a crook embezzling funds. His parents' marriage is not the happiest and during their arguments, Andrew often takes refuge in his bedroom to escape the family tension. The father transmits from an early age to his children, two boys and two girls, the value of money and success, but more than anything puts forward appearances. For Pete, it is important that others see success even if it is fake. Andrew Cannanen attends Bishop's School, an upscale private high school in La Jolla. His parents accede to his desire to join this school even if they do not have the means. It must be said that Andrew is from an early age very demanding, but also a liar. He makes people believe that he comes from a very rich background, very different from his by appropriating parts of life from third parties, but without revealing everything. It says enough to be imprecise, but at the same time to arouse curiosity. Very intelligent, he has an IQ of 147, and he is fluent in seven languages. Openly gay, he is not at all stigmatized by his classmates and on the contrary is quite popular. He is a child who loves being interested in him, who likes to be noticed. However, in high school, this underlying mythomania takes him down a dangerous path. He takes drugs and hangs out with kids who are very into this addiction. To satisfy these two needs, Andrew from the age of 15, began to frequent gay bars, often disguised to hide his age and his ethnic appearance. In 1987, he was 18 and graduated from Bishop. The way to study history is wide open to him, but rather than continue his studies, he prefers to seduce older, and especially rich, gay men, who employ him as a secretary and offer him gifts of up to two a car in the order of $30,000. While Andrew earns a good living performing the gigolo, his parents' lifestyle plummets. Her father is struggling to make it as a stockbroker and faces embezzlement charges of more than $106,000. To escape prison, Pete Modesto Cannanen abandons his family and flees the country. Marianne, abandoned, then moved to a less affluent neighborhood. Andrew joined the University of California in San Diego, which he left less than a year later, and left to visit his father who had returned to the Philippines. This one is reduced to poverty. Andrew returns and leaves to settle in San Francisco where he resumes his gigolo activity by assuming different identities. He begins to frequent bars including Lou Castro, invents stories from the pages of magazines he reads, GQ, Vanity Fair, Vogue, tells that he is the son of an Israeli billionaire, meets Eli Gould a lawyer who knows the world and finds himself attending all kinds of major events. In 1990, the San Francisco Opera hired Johnny Versace, a young Italian designer, to create the costumes for its new production, Capriccio. At the initiative of an evening given at the Colossus, a gay club, in honor of the premiere, Andrew Cannanen manages to meet Versace. It is the designer who approaches him taking him for someone else. Some time before, Versace had met a young man near his villa in Italy at Lake Como who looks like Andrew. 
This one does not deny it. Accustomed to lying about his identity, he does not correct him and plays the game. At the end of the evening, he rushes to visit friends in Berkeley to shout his joy at having met the Italian designer he admires. Some time later, Andrew resettles in San Diego and becomes a figure in the gay district of Hillcrest where he pursues prostitution. In 1993, he met Jeffrey Trail, a naval officer, his complete opposite. Jeffrey is an upright man, now a liar for a penny, abiding by the laws. The two men become friends. In 1994, Andrew had a client of a wealthy businessman, Norman Blatchford, who has just lost his companion after 26 years together. The two men have a relationship during the year and Andrew ends up moving into Norman's apartment in La Jolla. The businessman showers his new lover with gifts, she clothes, a new car. Andrew is over the moon, but he can't settle for just one man. He then met David Matson a 31-year-old architect from Minneapolis. He falls in love with him, regularly invites him to dinner and covers him with presents while taking care that David does not discover his unmentionable secrets, violent sexual practices and methamphetamine, and especially his relationship with Norman Blatchford. While spending the summer with Norman in the south of France, Andrew can't help but write love letters to David Madsen. Back in the fall in La Jolla, Andrew demands from Norman, so that he does not leave him, that he offers him a luxury car worth $25,000. Norman refuses and kicks him out. For his part, David is overwhelmed by Andrew's behavior and his unpredictable mood swings. It must be said that as he gets older, the darker sides of Andrew begin to emerge and the young man shows his practice of sadistic acts in the pornographic films in which he plays. He also begins to derive pleasure from the pain and humiliation he inflicts on his partners. Jeffrey Trail, Andrew's best friend, tells him in turn that he is leaving the Navy and Minneapolis. The blow for Andrew is severe. He no longer knows what to do or where to go. He has the impression that everything escapes him and that he no longer has anyone. In April, he nevertheless organizes a party where he announces that he wants to leave for San Francisco. But in fact, he bought himself a one-way ticket to Minneapolis where, it must be said, no one wants him. It must be said that at the age of 27, even the gay and wealthy men to whom he used to offer his services pay him less attention. Andrew began to put on weight, and his once well-groomed hair grew long and unkempt. He also shows some signs reminiscent of the first symptoms of AIDS. The doctor he is going to see reassures him, but Andrew will never look for the results of his blood test which will ultimately turn out to be negative. On April 25, 1997, Andrew Kananen flew to Minneapolis and persuaded David Matson to pick him up at the airport. He stops in front of Jeffrey's apartment, enters inside thanks to the key he finds under the doormat, begins to search the home and finds the weapon that it hides. Andrew comes out of the house and then persuades David to let him spend the night in his loft. Despite his reluctance to accede to his desire, however, he ends up welcoming it. On the evening of April 27, Jeffrey Trail discovers that his pistol has disappeared. At 9.45 p.m., he then went to David Matson and fell on the young man when he came down to go for a walk with his Dalmatian. Witnesses will say that noises of arguments followed by blows and deaf noises were heard in the evening. After two days of absence, David Matson's work colleagues start to worry. They ask the building superintendent to go and check on the apartment if everything is fine. Opening the door, she finds that there is blood everywhere and spots a body wrapped in a carpet. She immediately calls the police who arrive on the scene a few minutes later. The pathologist will declare that it is in fact that of Jeffrey Trail, murdered by 27 hammer blows to the head and chest. In the apartment, the police do not spot Andrew's suitcase right away, although it is labeled with his name and thus lets several other clues pass. Seeing that David Madsen S 4x4 has disappeared, the inspectors suspect the young man of having committed the crime enough. She publishes a search notice in the county. The man, contrary to what the police think, is in fact Andrew's hostage who dragged him into his escape. Frightened by the psychotic behavior of his ex-lover, David first tries to reason with him before pretending to play the game in order to preserve his life. On May 3, 1997, 
two fishermen unfortunately discovered David's body on the shore of a lake north of Minneapolis. Andrew Kananen shot him once in the back and twice in the head fired from the .40 caliber revolver borrowed from Jeffrey Trail. Following this, the police review the clues left and return to the apartment. There she gets her hands on a black bag containing handcuffs, sadomaso porn movies, .40 caliber bullets and an empty gun holster. The suitcase belongs to a certain Andrew Kananen. The authorities are launching a new search warrant. May 4, 1997, Chicago. Marilyn Milklin returns home from a business trip where she presented her new line of cosmetics on TV consisting of perfumes, creams and colognes. Returning from the airport, she finds her house, located in the bourgeois district of the city, upside down. Her husband, Lee, a successful real estate tycoon, has disappeared. Marilyn immediately calls the authorities who, after having taken a look in the house, search the garage and discover the husband's body hidden under the family 4x4. Lee's head is wrapped in grey duct tape and takes more than 50 blows with a pair of pruners. His throat was slowly cut with a pruning saw and his body crushed by his own car. The police put their hands in the sink on beard hairs which suggests that the murderer shaved before or after his crime. He would also have eaten in the fridge a piece of ham. Marilyn Milklin realizes that the couple's Japanese car is missing as well as $2,000 in cash and gold coins. Three days later, an agent notices, in a street adjacent to the property, a car with a windshield full of fines. This is David Madsen. S. Automobile. The FBI is seized of the case. An arrest warrant is issued for Andrew Kananen. Thanks to the telephone which is on board the vehicle and which is connected to the starter, the authorities manage to follow the movements of the 4x4. On May 8, the car was spotted in the suburbs of Philadelphia, but the information repeated by the newspapers alerted Andrew who got rid of the telephone, then the vehicle in a disused cemetery in New Jersey. He surprises the goalkeeper who sees nothing coming and makes him kneel before shooting him in the head. William Reese dies instantly. Andrew then grabs Reese's red van. The latter's wife, alerted by his absence from the dinner, informs the police who go to the scene where they discover the body of the guard and Lee Milklin's car parked a little further. The authorities understand that Andrew Kananen is the author of this murder and shares the info with the FBI. The national media is also picking up the story. While the television coverage feeds Kananen as ego, it still poses a problem for him as his face is on the front pages of news channels and newspapers. On May 11th, Andrew arrives in Miami Beach and travels to South Beach. There, it will be easy for him to blend in with the gay community and passing tourists. He rents a room at the Normandy Plaza Hotel on Collins Avenue, Miami Beach, an avenue where shabby hotels are enthroned and wandering vagabonds steeped in whiskey. Andrew reads a report in the month's Vanity Fair about the opulent residence of Johnny Versace. Fashion Emperor spent $32 million to renovate Casa Casuarina as 5,800 square meters. The mosaics that make up the floor are imported from Italy and intertwined with gold threads, the rooms are full of works of art from all eras, the ceilings are enhanced with frescoes of naked angels and the toilets are in solid gold. Versace can afford it. He is at the head of an empire, the Versace brand, which is worth a billion dollars. Johnny Versace is at the height of his glory. He has just presented his new line of metallic dresses which critics are applauding. During the following days, Andrew operated on him, a certain routine. During the day, he reads fashion magazines and watches TV. In the evening, he scours the nightlife in search of money to survive. He commits petty thefts, engages in prostitution and sometimes abuses painkillers that he couples with vodka. The weeks pass and the money flies. He goes to a pawn shop and sells the gold coins stolen from Lee Miglin for $190. He doesn't even bother to conceal his true identity or the address of the hotel where he is staying as if he wanted to taunt the authorities who are still looking for him. The pawnbroker faxes the statement to the Miami Beach police as required by law, but the paper ends up on the desk of a vacationing employee, the police will get their hands on it after the Versace murder. In mid-June, 
Andrew Kananen becomes the 449th person to join the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Booklets are distributed, a local newspaper talks about it, but nothing helps. No one recognizes Andrew amid Miami wildlife. Until July 11th when the cashier of a sandwich shop reports it. But when the police arrive, Kananen is already far away. He is spotted again, later, in a nightclub, the twist, but again without success. The next day, he leaves his hotel without paying and disappears into the wild. This same morning, Tuesday, July 15th at 8.15 a.m., Johnny Versace leaves his companion, Antonio D'Amico with whom he has been in a relationship since 1982, to sleep. Him, go out on the porch, then file on Ocean Drive. He stops to drink a cappuccino at the news cafe before buying the Daily Press, Newsweek, The New Yorker, but also fashion magazines, Vogue, People. He goes home, climbs the steps of his palace. It's 8.45. Johnny Versace hears a noise behind him and turns around. A man wearing glasses, backpack and cap stands in front of him. He doesn't recognize the one he had accosted in San Francisco a few years earlier. Andrew Cunnan puts the barrel of his .40 caliber on the dressmaker's cheek and pulls the trigger. The dressmaker collapses. A second projectile then passes through his neck. Kananen fled, pursued by a friend of Versace who had just seen his friend's body collapsed on the steps of the villa. The designer was immediately taken to the Jackson Memorial where he died a few minutes later, at 9.21 a.m. As for Andrew, he managed to escape. Dozens of police arrive at the scene of the shots, soon followed by a parade of journalists and onlookers. The police find Kananen. S trail in a hospital parking lot and come across William Reese's pickup truck, littered with trash. On the ground, used clothes show that Andrew changed before fleeing. The manhunt is in full swing. All police forces are requisitioned. Hundreds of investigators are put on the job and all acquaintances of Kananen are interrogated. Andrew Kananen's wanted notice is plastered all over the United States and his photo is broadcast on all the country's channels. The pawnbroker who had dealt with the killer a few weeks earlier contacted the authorities leading the investigators to Normandy Plaza. A SWAT team raids the hotel room but finds no trace of him. Two days later, the hotel staff realizes that they have given the investigators the wrong room number. A week goes by before a guard notices only a barge of which he has the load broken into and ransacked. At the scene, he bumps into Kananen, who scares him. An exchange of gunfire then takes place. Alerted, the police arrive in less than five minutes at 5,250 Collins. The police bombarded the barge with tear gas and evacuated the boaters around it. Snipers take up position on the other side of the street. The siege continued all afternoon under the watchful eye of the cameras which broadcast the event live. At the same time, in Milan, the funeral of Johnny Versace takes place, also broadcast, with Lady D and Elton John seated in the front row. In Miami, the police struggle to get Andrew out of hiding and finally decide to meet him. When they enter the premises, the TV is on, the armchair is transformed into a bed. Arriving on the second floor, the police fall on the body of the murderer, lying, his weapon not far from him. Cunning committed suicide by turning the gun over in his mouth, thus ending his run. At 10.45 p.m., the police issued a statement to the press and confirmed the death of the murderer, among others, of Johnny Versace. Andrew Kanan achieved what he wanted, to become famous by finally dreaming of the lives of others. Andrew's self-esteem was tied to what people could do for him and what they thought of him. This trait was certainly shaped in the first place by his father who kept telling him when he was little that no matter what appearances mattered, he had to be someone the same man he saw fall later. Being accepted by high society and wealthy people was what Andrew wanted. Her mind must have started to rock with the rejection of her sugar daddy, Norman Blatchford. The psychotic. S motive relating being fusional, one can wonder if the fragmentation of the psyche has already begun or if Andrew succeeded in preserving a minimal unity which prevented him for some time from tipping over towards murder which he does not will manage to do more next, with the supposed betrayal of Jeffrey and David. 
Andrew had lost, along with Norman, easy access to wealth. Then he swung into paranoia when he realized that two of his lovers, Jeffrey Trail, a former naval officer, and David Madsen, an architect, were seeing each other behind his back. He couldn't bear to no longer be the center of attention of the two men. They also gave him the image of a successful person, while he had to prostitute himself to live. He envied them just as he envied Johnny Versace whom he idolized, but who had perhaps not given him the important sought during this evening in San Francisco. The announcement of possible AIDS, the sadomaso practices in porn, prostitution and the fact that his body thickens and becomes less attractive have certainly also contributed to his loss of control. Having left no suicide note, his motivations still remain mysterious today. As we come to the end of this unsettling journey into the twisted minds of Gary Charles Edward and Andrew Philip Cananan, we are left with a profound sense of awe and unease. The complexities of the human mind have been laid bare, reminding us of the darkness that can reside within. May this exploration serve as a reminder to seek understanding, compassion, and vigilance as we navigate the complexities of the human experience.